Dear friends, we will look at the life and teachings of Swami Saradananda today. This is the concluding part of the three part series. In part one, we looked at Swami Brahmananda. In part two, Swami Shivananda. And today, Sharat Maharaj or Swami Saradananda. And I apologize for this irregular kind of an arrangement. As you know, we are in unprecedented times and these challenging times require innovative solutions. So that's uh, how we are telecasting this tonight. My apologies, number one, for this unusual arrangement and also for not being able to answer your questions because the format that we have agreed to, uh, it uh, makes it very difficult to ask questions at the end of the talk. But if you have questions, please email them to the Vedanta Society and they will forward it to me and I will try to answer to the best of my ability. So Sharat Maharaj, uh, his pre-monastic name was Sharat Chandra Chakravarti. He was born on December 23rd, 1865. So you can say about three years junior to Swami Vivekananda, a, an outstanding monk uh, of the Ramakrishna order, an outstanding monk of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. And the epithet that he is most familiar with is Bharavahak. Bharavahak in English means the bearer of many burdens. And in fact, Swami Sardananda um, shouldered so many responsibilities simultaneously. He uh, was the general secretary of the Ramakrishna Matan mission uh, from 1898 to 1927, almost 30 years. He also took care of Holy Mother. He was Holy Mother's, he used to call himself doorkeeper, but he managed uh, Holy Mother's itinerary uh, Holy Mother's, when she would go to Joy Rambati, he would be the one arranging all that and sometimes even accompanying her. And same when Holy Mother would want to come from Joy Rambati to Calcutta. And he also built for Holy Mother her permanent place in Calcutta. We'll, we'll get a chance to talk about it. And he wrote this magnum opus, Sri Sri Ramakrishna Lila Prashongo, a wonderful book which helps us uh, get the sense of how deep Sri Ramakrishna's sadhana was. And in order to write that kind of a biography, how much preparation and effort and spiritual discipline Saradananda Maharaj had to put, we get some sense of it. So before I forget, I just wanted to mention one more thing and that is Saradananda Maharaj is perhaps the uh, only uh, direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna who came to Providence. We have evidence of him uh, speaking at the Manning Hall of Brown University on April 20th, 1897. He was the guest of Professor Delabar. Professor Delabar was a very famous professor at that time uh, at Brown. And in fact, he stayed with Professor Delabar at his house on 9 Arlington Avenue, which is on the east side of Providence. And it's about less than 
half a mile from our Vedanta Center. So Sharat Maharaj physically also was very close to us. Now, Now, Sharat Maharaj was, as I said, his pre-monastic name was Sharat Chandra Chakravarti. His father's name was Girish Chandra Chakravarti and his mother's name was Nilmoni Devi. His father was a partner in uh, a pharmacy called Druggist's Hall, a foreign owned pharmacy and his father was a partner in the Calcutta uh, operations of it. A very, so Sharat Maharaj was born into a very affluent family, but we see signs of his generosity and big heart, uh, even from childhood. So as a childhood, uh, in his childhood, when he would see people in dire need, he would donate money from, his pocket money. If he didn't have money, he would donate his belongings like his umbrella and clothes, etc. So very generous. And we also know that in the locality, he was born in what was known as Amherst Street in Kolkata, North Calcutta very close actually to Swami Vivekananda's house, which was on Shimla. Uh, Shimla, not the uh, city in Himachal Pradesh, but Shimla, which was a locality in Kolkata, in North Calcutta. So he was born in Amherst Street, but unfortunately that house was raised down in order to extend the main road, which is called as, uh, most people call it Harrison Road, uh, that's the British name. Now it is called Mahatma Gandhi Road, but still people refer to it as Harrison Road. So unfortunately, the house that he was born in, we don't have it anymore. But in that locality, uh, we read that a, a lady, a maid servant in uh, one of the neighboring houses, she uh, was diagnosed with cholera. Cholera was a very infectious disease in those days. And it is very opposite that we are talking about an infectious disease today when this COVID-19 infectious disease has pretty much shut down so many states um, of this country. Anyway, so this lady, once she was diagnosed with cholera, her um, employers, they basically just abandoned her. They put her on the terrace of the house and, and she had nobody to take care of, to take care of her, nobody who could take care of her. So Sharat and his friends, Sharat, the, the leadership of Sharat, he brought his friends together and nursed this lady uh, arranged for her medicines and all that. Unfortunately, the lady didn't survive. But once she died, then they had to make funeral arrangements for her and Sharat is the one who did all of that. So Sharat was a very good student. He uh, went to hair school, a very well known school in Calcutta in those days and even today, I believe. Then he went to St. Xavier's college, a Jesuit college, still exists today, very reputed, very selective, very difficult to get into. And then his father, because as we saw, he was a uh, owner of a pharmacy chain, he wanted his son to be a medical doctor. So 
Sharat got admitted to the Calcutta Medical College for a medical degree, but he didn't finish it. We'll, we'll, we'll see that uh, why. Uh, besides uh, very good in academics, Sharat was also uh, very much into uh, maintaining his body and physique. As you can see from the picture, he was a uh, well-built, stout uh, man. And during his college days, he used to visit the gym uh, often and would take part in wrestling. And uh, it was at the gym where his friends and he, they heard of Keshav Chandrashen. Keshav Chandrashen was a very famous social reformer of those times who had founded uh, a branch of the Brahmo Samaj called Nava Vidhan, uh, a very fiery orator. And in his speeches, he would extol the virtues of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. So once they got to know about Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Sharat and his cousin Shashi, Shashi, who later became Swami Ramakrishna Nanda, another direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. So Sharat and Shashi, they went together to Dakshineshwar. When they went to see Dakshineshwar, Sri Ramakrishna was in his room and Sri Ramakrishna was talking about a, a, a social problem of that time. And he was saying that, see, today these young men, before they have any belief in God, before they develop any uh, kind of respect for and, and curiosity for God, they are uh, married they get married and then they have children and now they are burdened with all these family responsibilities and they just don't have the the the, the capacity to deal with them because of their lack of spiritual foundation so that is what sri ramakrishna was commenting upon and uh, there were some in the audience who tried to object saying oh do you mean uh, that there's something wrong with marriage and Sinam Krishna said, no, 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 I, uh, this I'm just trying to tell to these young kids like Sharat and Shashi, you don't have to take everything that I say. Uh, and then because Sri Ramakrishna realized that there was no way he could have a very frank one-on-one -on -one conversation, he told these two young boys, please come later alone. Now, um, at St. Xavier's College, where Sharat was studying, Thursdays used to be a holiday. So every Thursday, he would come to Sri Ramakrishna. And thus, his training began. And uh, um, the first instance of Sri Ramakrishna's uh, influence or Sri Ramakrishna's generosity, whichever way you want to look at it, was when uh, Sharat was asking Sri Ramakrishna for some spiritual experiences. One day, Sri Ramakrishna instructed him, and Sharat was saying, no, I, I, I don't really get any experience. I'm not, it's not helping me. So then Sri Ramakrishna took his index finger and pressed it uh, between the two eyebrows and eyebrows and immediately Sharat went into a deep meditative experience. So another time Sharat uh, was sitting with Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna was extolling the virtues of Ganesha. In Hindu mythology, Ganesha is a very loved personality. And Sri Ramakrishna was especially extolling how much devotion Ganesha had for his mother. So Sharat said, I also want to be like Ganesha. Sri Ramakrishna said, no, 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 no. You are not to be like Ganesha. I see latent attributes of Shiva in you. So Shiva should be your ideal. Why Sri Ramakrishna said that is a little inscrutable. But we see from Sharat's character that 
the main attribute of Shiva that perhaps Sri Ramakrishna was referring to was his calmness, composure, not getting rattled by anything. Then one day, Sri Ramakrishna was in a very generous mood and he said to his uh, um, uh, disciples, well, ask me whatever you want, ask for a boon. And some asked for bhakti, some asked for jnana. And, and when the time came for Sharat, Sri Ramakrishna asked him, well, what is it that you want to ask me? So Sharat said, no, I don't want anything except that I want to see Brahman in everybody and everything that I see. And Sri Ramakrishna said, well, that is good, but that is the last stage. I mean, there are so many steps one has to take to achieve that. He said, no, 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 I'm not interested in anything but that. And Sri Ramakrishna understood how serious this boy was. And he said, yes, you will get it one day. And we know Swami Sharadananda was a Brahmanyani, and we will see how indirectly he himself admitted to that. Then, um, as you can imagine, Sharat is coming very frequently to Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineshwar, and his father wants him to be a doctor, and his father is now concerned. So his father tries many tricks to lure him away from Sri, lure his son away from Sri Ramakrishna it doesn't work. He finally hits upon um, a, a tactic or a strategy and that is that Sharat is so impressed with Sri Ramakrishna. What if I bring with me a very famous kind of a scholar and that scholar debates with Sri Ramakrishna and defeats Sri Ramakrishna in the debate, then Sharat, my son, will be disillusioned and then he'll come back home. That was his father's idea. So he brought with him a very famous tantric scholar of those times, Jagan Mohan Torkalankar, and uh, Sharat's father, Girish, and Torkalankar, they go to meet Sri Ramakrishna and some conversation starts between the two, that means Torka Lankar and Sri Ramakrishna. And very soon Torka Lankar knows that Sri Ramakrishna is just a unique personality, highly spiritually evolved. He could gauge that very easily. So he takes Girish Sharat's father to a side and he says, I mean, your son is very lucky to have him as his guru. This kind of guru is, is not, one doesn't get so very easily. So his father cannot really do anything except makes one last try and he tries to get Sharat married. And then, of course, now because Sharat is so much in the fold of Sri Ramakrishna, he, he does need Sri Ramakrishna's permission. So he comes to Sri Ramakrishna and says, please let my son get married. And this time without Sri Ramakrishna saying anything, Sharat is uh, furious and he says, there's no way I will marry. I have decided on the spiritual path. And so his father realizes that he can't really do anything. And in that in a sense, that ends his medical education quest as well. He leaves all education to be with Sri Ramakrishna all the time. Now, um, one very funny incident. Uh, Sharat, as you can see from the picture, you can see very well built. So Sri Ramakrishna, as part of his training, he tells his um, disciples, one thing that is required of monks is to be able to beg for arms. Arms. You don't uh, cook your own food. You you go to people's houses, take little bit, little bit from each, and that that's the food that you then consume. 
So go to neighbor's houses and beg for arms. And Sharat goes and uh, knocks at the door and says, uh, give me arms, please. And a lady comes out and seeing his physique, she says, you are such a stout, well-built man. Can't you just get a job in some even state agency that you are just uh, going around neighborhood asking for arms? So <laughs> Sharat's arms uh, gathering mission was a complete failure. Uh, sometime during this time when Sharat is with Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna uh, praises to the hilt about Naren. There is this boy, Naren. Uh, please meet him. He is wonderful. Sri Ramakrishna uh, leaves no, no uh, superlative un, um, uh, unannounced about Naren. So Sharat, of course, is now curious. So he goes to meet Naren. And what does he find? He finds that he had met Naren before. And that meeting wasn't very nice meeting. What had happened was that Sharat had gone to a friend's house. And in that friend's house, as he entered the house, he saw Naren sitting there. And Naren was kind of perusing a book. Naren didn't even look at Sharat. And Sharat what could he do? He was just sitting, twiddling his thumb. And then the friend comes from inside the house. And the moment he sees Naren, he says, oh, Naren, you have come. And they start chatting. And they both are oblivious of Sharat's presence. So they start discussing. And they discuss something very interesting. Naren was saying that, you see, there are two kinds of literature. In the first kind, you idealize the real. So there is some uh, re real scenario, and you idealize it. So for example, if your protagonist is not a very moral, uh, conscientious person, you try to identify the reasons why this person may have fallen from the pedestal, things like that. So you you idealize the real. And Naren said, that is undesirable. What is desirable is the opposite. You realize the ideal. And Sharat, poor Sharat, listening to all this debate, he said, this guy, Naren, is full of bombast and, and uh, hyperbole. And so Sharat just left that, play, that room uh, very disillusioned about Naren. But now when he goes to see Naren after Sri Ramakrishna's admonition, he realizes what Naren is, what kind of a gem he is. And then they become very good friends. So by this time, we are into... Uh, so Sharat met Sri Ramakrishna in around 1883. And by this time, we are in... 1885, 6-ish, so Sri Ramakrishna's throat cancer has been diagnosed. He's been brought from Dakshineshwar to Shampukur. Sharat was with him. From Shampukur to Kashipur, Sharat was with him. Sharat was in all this time. After Sri Ramakrishna attains Mahasamadhi, then the Boranagor Ashram, which we talked about uh, during Swami Shivananda's uh, lecture. Uh, Sharat was there in the Boranagar Ashram as well. And as we saw with Swami Brahmananda and Swami Shivananda, and perhaps with all of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, except for maybe Swami Ramakrishna Nanda, all of them, they went out on pilgrimages. So Sharat also went out on many pilgrimages. And there are some very inspiring incidents uh, which happened as part of his pilgrimage. Let's just look at a couple. Um, this is uh, Nilakantha Mahadev, uh, a pilgrimage site in the Himalayas, uh, about uh, 17 kilometers from Rishikesh. Uh, when you go for pilgrimage sites in the Himalayas, typically your first starting point is Hardwar. And Hardwar is a 
kind of a big city. From Hardwar, you go to Rishikesh, very close by. And from Rishikesh, you then start the ascent up the mountains to these pilgrimage sites. So this is uh, Nilkantha Mahadev. And when they reach that place, they, they meaning uh, Sharat went with uh, Hari Maharaj Swami, Turiyananda. So Sharat and Hari, they visit the temple and they sit down to meditate. By the time their meditation is done, it is evening. And now they have to come back. This, um, uh, I mean, they have to descend from that uh, high altitude. So it's dark and very soon they come into a kind of a jungle area and it is dark. They have no light with them. So they are lost basically. Now what to do? Um, what happens is they kind of walk a little bit and then they come to a fork in the jungle. And the two then decide that we should not be together because that jungle was notorious for all kinds of wild animals. So they are afraid. And so they decide that they should separate because at least one of them, uh, if they reach the village, they can then ask for help and try to save the other. Because if the two of them go together, then if a wild animal attacks them, then they, both of them are done, basically. So that was their idea. So Sharat and Hari, they separate. It so happens that Hari Maharaj's road was, uh, it was not a road really, the, the path that Hari Maharaj took was the right path. It brought him to the village. He comes to the village. He narrates the incident, tells them that he has his friend who's kind of in the jungle. So they wait for the dawn. In the morning they go and uh, Hari retraces his steps. They pretty much go to the place where they separated. And what do they find? They find Sharat sitting under a tree meditating. And Hari Maharaj says, what? I mean, um, is this a place to meditate? I mean, and is this the time to meditate? So as we saw, Sharat is such a calm, cool-headed person. He says, well, uh, what could I do? It was dark and there was nothing else to do. So I thought if I die, if I uh, get attacked by a wild animal and die, why not die meditating? What could be a better way to die? So you see how evolved Sharat was spiritually. Then another incident, this is uh, Yamunotri close to Yamunotri. Yamunotri is the location where the river Yamuna, uh, the source of the river Yamuna is. So these uh, sites in those days were very treacherous sites, very precarious because there was no proper road. Uh, Many a time they were covered with ice, the paths, and you had to very carefully hop from one stone to the other to kind of go along. So they were descending. Again, Hari Maharaj was with him. So they were descending and they didn't have much except for the clothes on themselves and a walking stick. So as they were descending, Hari Maharaj goes a little ahead. Sharat Maharaj falls behind. And what happens is that Sharat Maharaj, he sees an old lady trying to descend without any walking stick. And again, the generous person that he was, he goes to that old lady, gives his walking stick and now Without a walking stick, you can imagine how difficult it is to climb down those, uh, to hop down those uh, ice-covered steps. But anyway, everything went fine, ultimately. Uh, another very interesting incident. They are at a pilgrimage site. They are in a village. 
And in those days, getting food at a pilgrimage site was not very easy. First of all, these monks, they did not have any money. So they would have to uh, rely on the generosity of people. And there were these uh, places where you could get some basic food, um, chapati and some dal and some um, vegetables at the most, things like that. But Sharat, he now wants to test Sri Ramakrishna. Of course, Sri Ramakrishna is not in the physical frame anymore. Uh, but Sharat says to himself that I will not eat anything except for puri and halwa. Puri is fried dough and halwa is uh, sweet farina pudding. So you can imagine those are delicacies. You can't expect to get them in a village at a pilgrimage site. But Sharat makes this vow, I'll not eat anything other than that. Let me test how powerful Sri Ramakrishna is. And what do we find? Very soon, a person comes to Sharat and he says, please come with me to my shop. I made some puri and I saw you in a dream. So just imagine. So when Sharat recounts this to Hari, uh, they both laugh. And one final uh, incident uh, regarding, this was not exactly a pilgrimage site, but very close to it. What happens is Swami Vivekananda, is he, he falls ill in Kashmir. And a telegram comes to Kolkata that Swami Vivekananda is ill. So Sharat rushes. And in those days, as you can imagine, Kashmir is northern part of India. Calcutta is far east. So it took a long time to get there. He took a train from Howrah to Rawalpindi, then another bus to Baramula. And from Baramula, he took a horse carriage to go to Srinagar. So he is in this horse carriage. It's a very narrow road, a mountainous road, very narrow road. And suddenly a landslide occurs. And because of the landslide, the horse is now very frightened. And the horse starts to kind of go sideways. And all Sharat Maharaj's luggage just falls out of the carriage into the ravine, into a ravine. And if the sideways movement of the horse was not bad enough, another horse carriage comes from the opposite side and these two horses on seeing each other, they are so frightened that Charat Maharaj's carriage, it just rolls over. And a rolling boulder falls on the horse, the horse is dead, the carriage man falls unconscious, falls out of the carriage unconscious. And luckily, the carriage, as it is careening down the slope, it gets caught in a bush. And it just kind of stabilizes there. Sharat Maharaj, as we have seen, the calm <laughs> that is, he just coolly gets out of the carriage. Uh, there were a lot of thorns and all that. So he kind of removes all the thorns from his clothes, goes to the carriage man who's unconscious, lifts him up, and he carries him to the village to get medical assistance for him. So you can see how cool composed he was. We fast forward to um, 1898, 1896, sorry. Swami Vivekananda is in the West. Um, 1893 Parliament of Religions is over and he's now lecturing extensively in the United States. So he calls Sharat to help him with this spreading of Vedanta in the West. And he says to Sharat, please come to London and I will come, I meaning Swami Vivekananda, I will come to London as well. And uh, uh, then I will tell you what to do. 
So Sharat Maharaj goes to London. Swami Vivekananda comes there as well. And from there, they come to the United States. And uh, in the United States, the time comes for Sharat Maharaj to give his first public lecture. So Sharat Maharaj had never given one before, so he's nervous. So Swami Vivekananda teaches him how to give a lecture. So Sharat Maharaj listen, listens, and then he starts giving his speech. And Sharat Maharaj, he would move his hands too much. His face would be very expressive. And Swamiji said, no, 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 no. That is not the way you give a speech here. You have to be very calm. You, your hands cannot move. You have to be very still. And then Swamiji took a cane with him and he told Sharat, okay, start again. And the moment Sharat Maharaj would raise his hands or kind of move his hands, Swamiji would whip him with that cane. So Swamiji was very strict in these things. So um, he, he is of course very successful with his speeches, Sharat Maharaj that is. Uh, one very funny incident happens at Ridgely Manor as you know, uh, Ridgely is so close to us and uh, Swami Yogatmananda Ji Maharaj goes there every year during Labor Day to give a retreat. So many of you have gone with him uh, to Ridgely, a very historic place, as we all know. So at Ridgely, um, uh, Sharat Maharaj was also there. And, and so was Josephine McLeod, who, as you know, was the sister-in-law of Leggett. So um, when... Sharat Maharaj would come to the breakfast table. Josephine would ask him, did you sleep well? Every day she would ask him, did you sleep well? So one day, Sharat Maharaj goes to give a public lecture near Ridgely Manor and Josephine McLeod accompanies him. And while he's speaking, he notices that Josephine has fallen asleep. <laughs> So at the end of the lecture, when the time comes to shake hands, now Sharat Maharaj asks Josephine, did you sleep well? And both of them, they laughed heartily. Uh, again, fast forwarding, Sharat Maharaj is now called back to India in 1898 because the Ramakrishna Mission and Mutt have been established. And Swami Vivekananda was looking for a general secretary no better person than Sharat. So Sharat is called back and he assumes this responsibility uh, from 1898 to 1927 for about 30 years. And uh, general secretaryship of the mission in those times and even today, very challenging. Uh, more so in those times because A, the financial situation was so bad and B, uh, because at that time, what had happened was that there were many uh, young men who were very deep in the revolutionary movement. As you know, India was under the control of the British. And so these young men were perhaps the first band to try to revolt against the British. And these revolutionaries, um, they would uh, get arms and they would um, plan and execute many violent activities. Their motto was that only through violence would the British be forced to leave India. But some of them, they also, once they read about Swami Vivekananda and when they uh, saw the brother disciples, brother monks uh, of Swami Vivekananda, they were very influenced by this Ramakrishna movement and some of them, they joined the Ramakrishna movement. Now, the problem was that the British had these revolutionaries on their radar. So 
when they joined the mission, they, the British thought that this was just a ruse. And so the British created all kinds of problems for the mutton mission. And a big question arose, what to do? Should we let these revolutionaries turned monks stay in the ashram or should we just ask them to leave? And Holy Mother stood firm. She said, no, they have come to take refuge in Sri Ramakrishna. We cannot abandon them. They have to be there. But we, Sharat Maharaj as General Secretary did have to face the wrath of Krishna. So we know of a case where a Swami, he, uh, what, because he was a revolutionary, Atma Prakash Ananda, because he was a revolutionary, uh, he had to go to a police station every often, every few days, and Sharat Maharaj had to accompany him to kind of verify and attest that this man, the last three or four days, was in the ashram all the time, etc., etc. Now, the British police was kind of mad at the mission for harboring these uh, revolutionaries. So they ill-treated uh, Swami Shardananda very much. They wouldn't talk to him. They would ask him to sit at a bench for hours together before they would uh, attend to him. So this Atma Prakashananda, he became very furious and uh, he was about to wrap. Sharat Maharaj just caught hold of his hand, asked him to. Just stay quiet. And then after a few hours, the, the police officer would just ask a few questions. Within minutes, they would be then uh, released. And so while coming back, this revolutionary is furious. He said, Maharaj, if only you had allowed me, I would have just killed that man. No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so Atma Prakashananda says, no, no, it's not for me, but it's because of how much they disrespected you, how much they ill-treated you. And Sharananda, Shardananda says, don't worry about me. I am at a state where these things don't rattle me. And what he was saying indirectly is his consciousness had evolved to such a level. These things were kind of very, very trifle for him. Uh, some more uh, incidents uh, which he had to face, Sharat Maharaj had to face uh, as part of being the general secretary. Uh, at Udbodhan, and we'll talk about Udbodhan a little more, it was uh, a branch of the mission as well as the uh, residence of the Holy Mother. So at Udbodhan, there were all kinds of monks who would not get along with anybody else. So if a monk couldn't be accommodated anybody, anywhere else, he would be sent to Udbodhan. So Udbodhan had this full of uh, misfits and uh, ill-tempered monks. So one, of, one such incident, uh, Swami Sardananda was giving some instructions to a monk and the monk flatly said, no, I, I won't do it. So Swami Shardhanan said, why, why won't you do it? So he said, well, we are here working for the mother, holy mother that is. And you can imagine this would be the perfect case of insubordination. This is the general secretary, a Brahma Gyani. But what did Sharat Maharaj do? He said, very coolly. He said, you see, we all are here to work for holy mother. And all of us want the good of the Holy Mother. So we have to be in this together. Another incident, um, this is more a reflection of the Hindu society at those in those times. The Hindu society was very regressive, especially with regards to women who were widows. So if you were a widow, then it was a very unfortunate situation for you. Now, some of these women, they had some few belongings, treasured belongings, some money, some jewels, and they had no place to keep. Because they, the, the, if they give it to their family members, that would be appropriated. So 
they came to Swami Sardananda and Swami Sardananda was just like a mother to all. So they came to Swami Sardananda and they deposited their treasures with him. So a monk comes to Swami Sardananda and says, what is this? Why do these women, they come trying to say, they come to see you. You are a monk. Imagine a, a, a junior monk telling the general secretary. And what did Sardananda do? He said nothing. He just quietly left. The monk went away. After a few days, he saw the monk, he caught hold of him. He says, look, come, uh, come here. You know, the other day you asked me a question. Why do these ladies come to me? Uh, I couldn't answer you then. I asked Sri Ramakrishna. And what did Sri Ramakrishna say? He said, they come to you because they say me. They see, see me, me meaning Sri Ramakrishna in all of them. So from this we can see how spiritually evolved Swami Sardananda was. And one last incident regarding his general secretaryship. Uh, it so happens that a Swami comes from Kashi and or Vrindavan, Vrindavan, I believe. And uh, Sharat Maharaj, when he sees the Swami, he's very angry because the rule in those days and even today was that if you leave your ashram, you have to inform the uh, head office and the, the uh, basically Swami Sardananda. And so Swami Sardananda gets very angry at this person, says, you came without even informing me. And the monk says, no, no, Maharaj, I did inform you. Swami Sardananda said, no, I did not get any thing from you. So anyway, the monk left. A few days later, Swami Sardananda, while looking at the contents in his drawer, he finds a letter from that monk. So it was Swami Sardananda who had misplaced the letter. So the moment he realizes this, what does he do? He goes to Swami Brahmananda, the president of the order, and he says, Rakhal, I cannot do this. I have committed such a mistake. I cannot remain the general secretary anymore. I have to resign. And after a lot of pacification from Swami Brahmananda and the other monks, they somehow pacify him. And Swami Shardananda then calls that monk and apologizes to that monk as well. See, I was very um, unfair to you. So you can see how, um, what strong moral compass he had. Now let's come to Holy Mother. Swami Sardananda said repeatedly, that he would like to be remembered as the doorkeeper to the Holy Mother. So after Sri Ramakrishna passed away in 1886, Holy Mother had to go through a very difficult time because she had no place. She couldn't stay in Kamar Pukur for a variety of reasons. At her home in Joy Rambati, her brothers were unwilling and unable to support her. So there was a problem there. And there was no place in Calcutta where she could stay. So very challenging times. So um, Swami Yogananda took care of her. He passed away. In fact, he passed away even before Swami Vivekananda. After that, Swami Trigunatitananda was responsible for uh, taking care of Holy Mother. In 1902, he was sent to the United States, West Coast. So from 1902 till Holy Mother passes away in 1920, she is under the care of Swami Sardananda. And Holy Mother relied on Swami Sardananda so much that she would say, Sharot is my Vasuki. And without Sharat, she would not do anything. If, as we have seen before, if she had to go from Kolkata to Joy Rambati, Sharath has to arrange. 
if she has to come from Joyrambati to Kolkata, Sharath has to arrange. Where would she in Kolkata, Sharath has to arrange. So finally, Sharath in 1909 decides that there has to be a permanent place for Holy Mother. This temporary arrangement in Kolkata is just not working. And so he goes and takes 11,000 rupees personal loan. In those days, 11,000 rupees was a huge amount. He takes a personal loan and builds this Udbodhan Mayer body. The picture that you see on the screen. This became the permanent house of the Holy Mother. But as we have seen, Sharat Maharaj, he considered himself the doorkeeper. So one very funny incident, uh, Sharat Maharaj used to sit in a room. I mean, as you enter this building, uh, to the left, there was a small room, and we'll talk a little more about the room a little later. Sharat Maharaj used to sit there, and whoever needed to visit Holy Mother, Holy Mother stayed on the second floor. So Sharat Maharaj would be the approver. If he approved, the person would climb the stairs and meet Holy Mother. So one day a person comes, and Holy Mother had some fixed timings when people could visit her. So a person comes outside of those scheduled hours. And Maharaj then tells the person, see, you can't meet Holy Mother because this is not the time. So that person, what he does is he just pushes Sharat Maharaj aside and he says, I have come to meet Holy Mother. Nobody can stop me. He just pushes Sharat Maharaj aside and then climbs up the stairs. Now, when he meets Holy Mother, that person that is, and he tells this and he is now repentant that he was very good to Sharat Maharaj. So, and he also realizes that when he has to come down, he will again meet Sharat Maharaj. So he's very nervous as well. And what happens? Well, when he comes down, he is very fearful. Sharat Maharaj embraces him. And he says, no, 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 you don't need to be sorry. You need to have this kind of devotion in order to get Holy Mother, that no obstacle would prevent you from meeting her. So he appreciates this sincerity in devotee. So about Udbodhan, uh, as, as I said, the room, as you enter to the left, that small room, that is where Sharat Maharaj used to sit, and that is where he wrote his magnum opus, Sri Sri Ramakrishna Lila Prashongo. And our Tuesday class is on the English translation of this book by Swami Chetanananda. So, uh, and I, I don't have to tell you how much important this book is to understand Sri Ramakrishna and also other people like Gopal Irma and Swami Vivekananda. And uh, so Sharat Maharaj used to say that he took to writing Lila Prashongo because we saw he had taken a debt and he had to repay the debt. So he repaid the debt by writing this Lila Prashongo, which was then published in Udbodhan. And Udbodhan sales soared because of this, and ultimately it became this book. But you can imagine, all of you have read that book, and you can imagine how much preparation needed was needed to write a book like that. And uh, uh, we know that uh, other people also tried to write biography of Sri Ramakrishna. I mean, uh, when we talk of the biography, the, there is always this gospel, Kothamrito. But gospel, as you all know, is not a biography, really. So other people tried to write a biography. And in fact, another Swami, he wrote a few pages and he brought them to Swami Sarda Nanda. And he said, see, this is what I have written and about Sri Ramakrishna, want to write this full biography. And Swami Sardananda listened to the man, listened to the monk. And then he said, no, you see, 
in order to write a biography, you need a chaprash. Chaprash in Bengali is a word in Bengali. It means you need the command. Do you have the command from Sri Ramakrishna? And it so happens that once he decided to write, that is Swami Sardananda decided to write, the same Swami that asked him, he said, Maharaj, have you received Chaprash? And Swami Sardananda replied, that is none of your business. Uh, but to another Swami, once the book was, the first volume was written, actually the first volume was volume three, the Bhava Mukha. Uh, once that was written, uh, another monk read it. And then he said, Maharaj, how did you know about what happens in Nirvikalpa Samadhi? And Sharat Maharaj says, well, I was, with, I was with Sri Ramakrishna. Did I spend that company mowing grass? And then he says this very wonderful statement that, I did not write anything that I did not personally experience. So that tells us what, uh, how spiritually evolved Sharat Maharaj was. And the way he wrote it for 10 years in that small room uh, on this desk that you see in the picture, he would uh, have uh, an ink pot, a nib pen, and he would dip that nib pen in the ink pot, keep writing. There was another pot which had just water, which he would do to clean the nib with a piece of dry cloth. No electricity in that room. And he would write for hours together in the morning, hours together in the evening for 10 years. And we know uh, from reminiscences that the, this place, Udbodhan, Holy Mother's place, Mayer Badi, as we call it, it was um, not a very conducive place to write such a serious biography. It had all kinds of monks, crazy monks, making all kinds of noises, so much so that one day, Golapma, who stayed with Holy Mother, who was a constant companion of Holy Mother, she became so angry at these monks. She said, don't you have any consideration for Sharat who's writing this book and you're making all this noise? And Sharat says, Golapma, don't, uh, you don't have to uh, scold them because I have told my ears not to listen to any noise. So, so much control, such a karma yogi, such a karma yogi he was, so much control he had. And um, uh, this uh, Lila Prashongo is not a complete biography. Uh, what happened is after Holy Mother passed away in 1920, and after Swami Brahmananda passed away in 1922, Sharat Maharaj lost all the will to complete that biography. And monks would pester him, Maharaj, please write or just dictate to, a, dictate to us. But he didn't. He said, if the command comes from Sri Ramakrishna, I'll do it. And apparently that command never came. So because he had... Uh, been working so hard for such a long time, his body started to fail. Though he was not too old. So this is 1920s. As we saw, he was born in 1865. So, uh, um, so I'm, because we are getting towards the end, I am now fast forwarding to the last days of Sharat Maharaj. And I'm reading from Swami Chetanananda's book, God Lived With Them. On 6th August, 1927, Sardananda followed his regular routine of taking his morning bath, meditating three hours in his room, and then going to the shrine to prostrate before the pictures of the Master and Holy Mother. 
on that day he stayed in the shrine for half an hour then came near the exit door and again returned to the shrine he repeated this unusual behavior a few times standing in front of holy mother's picture he silently prayed perhaps requesting her to take her tired son back when he finally came out of the shrine sardananda's face was glowing with joy and serenity it is said that during her last illness mother once remarked i am tired of this life i shall now depart with sharat in my arms and take him wherever i go after lunch sharat rested a little and in the afternoon he answered his mail dictating letters to his attendant and then signing them after vespers swami hari premananda and asheshananda went to sardananda's room and found him half reclining on his bed struggling to get up but unable to do so it was 8:30 pm he said to his attendants don't tell anybody make no noise i will go downstairs to meet the devotees soon but he felt dizzy and lay down on the bed his forehead began to perspire he asked is to medicated all and an ayurvedic medicine i am uh, skipping the next few sentences uh, sardananda's condition started to deteriorate rapidly he had a temperature of 105 degrees the doctors lost all hope and indicated that the final moment was imminent friday 19th august 1927 was the birth anniversary of shri krishna at about 1 am the monks began to chant hari om rama krishna at 2:34 am Swami Sardananda the great yogi and beloved disciple of Sri Ramakrishna breathed his last at <coughs> at that very moment in Belur mot Swami Shivananda heard the familiar and sweet voice of Sardananda Taragda I am going to Kashi at noon Sardananda's remains were taken from Calcutta to Belur mot and created there And, and thus ends the life of this remark <coughs> of this remarkable uh, saint and uh, direct disciple of shri ramakrishna and from these three brother disciples swami brahmananda shivananda and swami shardananda we get inspiration to redouble our efforts in our spiritual life niranjanam nityam anantam roopam bhaktanukampatrita vikraham vai ishavataram parameshvam ityam tam ramakrishnan shirasa namamaha thank you